I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, an experienced group of hikers die mysteriously on a lonely mountain in Russia. But unlike Dyatlov Pass, this time, someone survived to tell the tale. And the story she told will blow your mind. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my Nazuvibi Vujimuya co-host, Alice. I think that sounded like something out of Star Wars more how than many Russian. So, but that is how supposed many to be syllables Russian. was that? How many syllables it's was so that? It's so many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven syllables. Is there a a seven, seven syllable Russian word. Is there a, seven seven syllable is word. There a what is that? Sep, septuple syllabic word in the United, in the American language? In the American? English. I mean, I meant to say, I meant to say English language. I don't know. Like that term you just used, I can't even pronounce, much less a sep. Tumble. <laughs> sept. Syllabic. Sept syllabic. Word. I'm going to say sept syllabic is a word. I don't know that it sept is. Sept syllabic. That is a. Well, Thank there you, you go. Sept syllabic. Well, it wouldn't I, be I seven. Created, sept I created that. No, no. Septi syllabic, maybe? Mm. Septi syllabic no, itself is today. only five syllables. So. I know. I know. Well, is well, it a real Brett, word, though? Can I, can I give a word back to you then? Um, thanks for that. Septi syllabic. Sure. Descriptor. <laughs> You're welcome. That means unforgettable, and I'm sure no one will ever forget when I tried to pronounce that word. So there you that go. That was really cool. <laughs> and no one will ever forget you either, Alice. You you have left an indelible mark on the uh, podcasting landscape. I don't even know how to respond to a word like that except thank you. Oh, I do what I can. And, and it's and, a good setup for where we're going today in our in our episode. I know. Because we're going back to Russia today. We're climbing another Ooh. mountain. It didn't go so hikers. well last time, though. <laughs> and it's Except not the... going to go so well this time either. Uh-oh. All I got to say is if you want to climb a mountain in Russia, you got to be brave. I mean, the Russians are tough people. They're like hardy people, you know? Hardy. <laughs> and, but even they find these mountains to be to be life-threatening and challenging and and i know a lot of you guys really enjoyed our discussion of diatlov pass and we're back with what some people have called the other diatlov pass incident we got a lot of requests for this case when we did diatlov pass and so we decided why not i love diatlov pass so this is just an opportunity to do another weird strange story and and this one you know, the thing about Dyatlov Pass, for those of you who didn't, who did not endure our five-part series on Dyatlov Pass, I'll give you a little, very short, I promise, synopsis of Dyatlov Pass. So essentially, in the 50s, I think it was 1959, these hikers climbed this mountain in the Urals. Um, this name roughly translates as don't go there, which, you know, might have been a message, a sign, a clue as they say, that they shouldn't have gone there. But they went there anyway, and they died in these very mysterious circumstances. Their bodies had these strange wounds on them. They exited their tent on the side of the mountain in sub-zero temperatures, and the tent was actually cut from the inside, so it seemed like they were rushing out into the darkness. But when they left, they actually walked down this mountain in a single-file line, even though most of them were not dressed to survive that weather and the bodies were all found in different places, and some of them had these grisly wounds, and some wounds that really seemed like they were inexplicable. And it's a mystery that survived for decades, and people have written books about it. We did a five-part series on it. 
And it's really mysterious. And one of the reasons it's really mysterious is there was no one there to tell the tale. There was no one there to say what happened. I mean, maybe it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, maybe if we just knew what happened, we would be like, aha, of course, that's it. So simple, so simple. And there are some people who think it does have a fairly simple answer. But Dyalov Pass is not the only mysterious incident to occur in the vast wilderness of Russia. And as crazy as it is to think, it may not even be the most mysterious. And that brings us to Kumar Dabin, which is where we're going to be today. Now, this is a mountain range in southern Siberia in a region called Beratia, which is on the shores of Lake Baikal. And I just want to take a moment to talk about Lake Baikal because I am really interested in Lake Baikal. It's one of the most fascinating natural wonders in the world. So if you don't care about this, because this has nothing to do with the story, just go ahead and fast forward like 30 seconds. But it is the largest freshwater lake in the world. And in fact, and this is going to blow your mind if you don't know this, it is larger than all the Great Lakes combined, which is insane. I mean, you know, you see the Great Lakes from space. There's five of them. They're huge. If you, you know, if you know anything about American geography, they're very, they sort of define the border between the United States and Canada. And yet Lake Baikal is bigger than all of them. And it contains nearly a quarter of all the surface freshwater in the world. It's larger than Belgium. And it is incredibly clear with visibility down to 130 feet. This is not the kind of place you want to throw a gun, except for the fact that it is also the deepest lake in the world with a depth of over a mile or 1,652 meters for those of you who insist on using the metric system. So by comparison, Lake Superior, which is the deepest of the Great Lakes, is only 1,333 feet deep at its deepest point. So Lake Baikal is essentially three, four times as deep as the deepest Great Lake. And it is the oldest lake in the world, having existed for 30 million years. It's the kind of lake that, frankly, we probably could do some sort of Halloween episode on, because I'm sure Lake Baikal is... There have to be all sorts of legends about it. I mean, you got a mile-deep lake. Nessie is certainly swimming around down there. I can't even begin to think what a mile deep looks like without it being into the depths of like lava volcanic action. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe the ocean, right? But a lake, a lake that's a mile deep. I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's insane. But that's Lake Baikal for you. And it is a popular tourist destination, particularly for Russians. I want to go there. I'm going to go there one day. Absolutely. And it is the perfect place to launch a hike into the surrounding mountains of the Kumar Daben hikes the Russians call Turiata. And in August 1993, seven hikers set off to do just that. Alice, before we continue, I want to talk about one of the newest sponsors of the podcast, Progressive Insurance. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra saving? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. We're excited that the Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. So the group 
was led by Ludmila Korovina, a 41-year-old Russian hiker who had attained the rank of Master of Sports, the rank that Igor Dyatlov, you guys may remember, was trying to attain when he and his group set off on their fateful trip. In other words, Ludmilla was very experienced as a hiker, and she was well-known as a hiking instructor. She was known to teach her students survival skills in the wilderness, and some had criticized her for her drill sergeant-like approach to her teaching methods. But her students loved her, and they would have followed her anywhere. And I think it's interesting, the point you make about how Ludmilla is the superior to Dyatlov. Now, we spent a lot of time on Dyatlov Pass talking about how qualified the students were, the hikers were, because we really wanted to disabuse people of the notion that these were some experienced kids wandering off into the wilderness to climb some mountain that they had no business being on. But in fact, they were very experienced. But none of them were as experienced as Ludmilla. I mean, she... If, you know, if Dyatlov had done it for 20 more years after that day, then he would have been like her. I mean, that's how experienced she was. I mean, she's the kind of person that knows exactly what she's doing and, in fact, had taken it beyond just hiking. I mean, she's not just hiking mountains anymore. It's a survival experience for for her students as well. So so this is somebody who, who not only knows what she's doing, but knows how to survive in very dangerous conditions and certainly somebody That if you climbed up a mountain with, you would expect you'd be climbing back down the mountain with, and everything would go fine. But as we're going to see, that's not what happened. And I'd like to note here, too, there's a greater range in ages uh, of this group. But note that Ludmilla herself is 41, so very experienced. Also not as young as the Dyatlov group for the most part, right, who were mostly college age or uh, recently graduated from college age. People. She herself is, um, you know, getting to middle age. Then, don't worry, guys. Forty-one is super young right now. It's like the new. I know. 17. Uh, you're hurting me, Alice. <laughs> you're, you're killing me. My point is, her her uh, hypothalamus is fully formed. Is that the decision making <laughs> process? <laughs> I just said a word that I remember from something. <laughs> Hippocampus. I think it's your frontal cortex, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, frontal cortex. Maybe, I'm yeah. just, I'm just, I'm saying things that I heard on like the Animaniacs at some point. The hypothalamus the is a thing, but I don't remember what it does. Someone, <laughs> I'm sure someone like will write it in or us. something. Yes, no, I was just, I was just saying words from an An- Animaniac song. I'm sorry. Mm. Okay. Animaniacs. Anyways, let's Animaniacs. let's Animaniacs. talk about this group now. Unlike the Atlog Pass. We don't have a strong record of the other people in the hiking party. But we do know the most about Alexander, also known as Sasha, Chrisin, who Ludmilla had known for years. She considered him a son. And the others were Tatiana Filipenko, who was 24 years old, Dennis Shvakin, who is 19, Victoria or Vika Valasova, <laughs> who is 16, Timur Bapanov, who is 15 years old, and Valentina, who went by Valya Utachenko, who is 17. Brett, that was a lot. And, <laughs> oh, you did a great job. Whew, you did a great job. I was like sweating through all of that. I had been practicing uh, you, it you in my head them. for a long time. <laughs> you, you did such a good job. You nailed him. I've been practicing yeah, since the was... Atlog Pass. <laughs> mm, mm. You've come so far. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. I, well, it's okay. But, but note that this group is much more wide ranging, and we have some young, young hikers, 15, 16, and 17 years old. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to talk about when we talk about what happened, whether or not that was a factor in this. It is definitely important that. Um, Ludmilla and Sasha were as close as they were, as you're going to see. And the rest of it, you know, the young ages may very well factor in to to what we are going to describe to you. Now, as we said earlier, you know, something mysterious is going to happen here. And the the reason that we are able to tell you so much of what happened is because we are going to have a survivor. Someone is going to come back to tell the tale. And, you know, it's just a funny thing because 
you, you think to yourself, man, if we just had somebody who survived from Dyatlov Pass, all the questions would be answered. And this case kind of puts a lie to that, because as you're going to see, just because we have someone to tell us what happened does not mean that suddenly we have an explanation. So the group had come to the Irkutsk region, which if you ever played Risk, you know, Irkutsk is a valuable spot that you want to take. It's also one of the coldest places in the world. If you go to Irkutsk in the height of winter, it's like minus 100 degrees or something. It's like awful. Another place I want to go, I'd like to experience that. But in any event, this group, they come to Irkutsk where Kamar Dabin is located from Kazakhstan. And although the Irkutsk region is often subject to terrible weather, this is August and the forecast for the hikers was positive. The group was actually larger than the seven that we've told you about up to this point. Ludmilla's daughter, Natalia, was leading a separate hike up the mountain, and the two groups were supposed to meet up at the conclusion of their hike. So you've got this mountain in a very touristy region on the shores of Lake Bacall. You're going to see the map we'll put up on the website where you can view the way this went. In addition to these two groups, there was at least one other group that was hiking this mountain. And that fact just makes it even more mysterious what happened. As you may recall, when we talked about Dyatlov Pass, there were other groups who were out hiking, and some of them saw things in the sky that were strange, fires in the sky that they couldn't really explain, but they were a good distance away from where Dyatlov was. None of them were going through the pass that now bears his name. But in this case, you did have several groups who were hiking up this mountain who would have experienced very similar things to whatever was going on with the group. In any event, when the two groups were supposed to meet up, Ludmilla's group did not show. Now, this was concerning, I'm sure, for Natalia to some extent, but these hikes, as we talked about in the Outlaw Pass, are not scientific things. You can give sort of a general idea of when you're going to arrive, but until a couple days have passed, you're not going to have that great a concern. And this was particularly true with Ludmilla, who, as we said, would often use these hikes as an opportunity to teach her students things beyond just the hike itself. So for all they knew, for all Natalia knew, they were doing some survival exercises. There could be any number of reasons why the group didn't show when they were supposed to, but those happy thoughts all vanished fairly quickly when that survivor we talked about a few days later, Valentina Valya Utochinko, stumbled out of the forest half mad with hypothermia. Kayakers actually found her on the edge of a river and brought her to their camp. They gave her a coffee cup, not full of coffee, because this is Russia, full of vodka, and a miracle cure, if there ever was one. And Valya, immediately after downing that coffee cup full of vodka, came out of her stupor, and the story that she would tell would become a legend. And before we get to that story, note that we talked about how these are harsh conditions in these mountains. And even though it's August, when Valia is found by those kayakers, she is suffering from hypothermia. So you can imagine how intense these conditions are, that this is August, and she is in this state. Now, why is she in this state? According to news reports of the day, Valya and the group were heading up the slope towards the summit of the Kamar Dabin, and it was close to noon. Sasha was walking in the front of the group, then suddenly, without warning or any reason, Sasha collapsed. He was foaming at the mouth and blood was pouring from his ears and eyes. In moments, in front of the entire group, Sasha was dead. Ludmilla fell to her knees over the boy that she considered her son, and overcome by grief, she nevertheless gives what is the correct command in this situation. The group is to descend the slope, go to the forest, and get some help. Now, for her part, Ludmilla would not leave the boy. She put Dennis in charge, and the group began to descend. But they had not gone far when they heard Ludmilla also cry out. The group rushed back to her side, and they found her in the same state as Sasha, blood pouring from her eyes and ears and foaming at the mouth. As you can imagine, chaos followed. Hmm. 
Yeah. Ooh. Now that's pretty so crazy, right? I don't, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I'm not a doctor. I don't know things that would kill you so quickly, but usually when there's foaming at the mouth and blood coming out of your orifices, there's something very immediate, right? This is not some slow moving thing. And obviously when you see it in two different otherwise healthy people, my initial, my immediate thought is something external that they're coming into contact with rather than something internal like a brain aneurysm or underlying heart condition. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of your initial thought, right? Because it just doesn't seem possible that, I mean, this is a group of very, very healthy people. Now, they have, they've engaged in a strenuous hike and as Alice pointed out, it is colder than they thought it was going to be and those are all issues, but this sudden, violent, attack i mean this this is almost something it's like you know hemorrhagic fever that like alice said takes a while to develop that causes these kind of horrific symptoms and but this happens so suddenly and it happened to two people it would be one thing if one person experienced this but it happened to two people and they happened to be the two people who were closest in proximity to each other and we talked earlier about the ages of these kids and, and maybe it wouldn't matter. I mean, I feel like if I was hiking up a mountain and all of a sudden, you know, one of my good friends and the leader of the hike collapsed with blood pouring out of their eyes and ears and they're foaming at the mouth and then they're dead, I would probably freak out too. I don't know that I would maintain my calm, cool exterior. <laughs> but, but in any of it, these, these folks absolutely panicked. They 100% panicked, and you can 100% understand why. And it, it got crazy. It got crazy, and it got crazy very quickly. So as Alice said, you're imagining this scenario. They're, they're going up the mountain, and then this tragic thing happens. At which point, Ludmilla gives this command, descend the mountain. Because that's always what you want to do in a situation where you're in a hike or you're in the wilderness and something goes wrong. You want to go down. And it's always surprising. And there are so many of these mysterious disappearances where people go up. And people have all sorts of theories about that, about why people tend to go up the mountain when they should be going down the mountain. But the right thing to do is to go down. And so she tells them to go down. So she keeps control of her, her faculties. But she's basically thrown herself on this boy. I mean, she's overcome with grief and he's laying there dead. I mean, he's dead by this point. The blood still pouring out of his eyes. The group does what they're told. They start to go down, but they hear this, this cry, this horrific cry. And you can only imagine when they saw Ludmilla collapse as well. And I think it's really to their credit, uh, that they did probably what I would not have done. They ran to her aid as well. So you've got two people who've now died, but they're rushing up there to try and get to her, to try and help her. But as they approach, things start happening to them as well. One of the girls, Tatiana, was the first person to reach Ludmilla, and she was also the next to die. She fell to her knees, clawing at her throat as if she could not breathe as if she wanted to to somehow open up her her air passages so she could breathe and apparently this was so overwhelming to her that she wanted anything to give her relief there was a rock next to her and she began to bash her set, her head she began to bash her head against that rock until finally she knocked herself out she collapsed next to the rock and then she died there Victoria and Timor, they began to run, so they are they want to get away from whatever this is that's just killed now three of their friends. So they've all they ran up to to Ludmilla and the one in front is now bashing her head against a rock. So these two, they want to run, but they had made it merely feet when they also collapsed to the ground, clawing at their throats, ripping at their clothes, and vomiting blood. Now all that's left at this point. They're, they quickly die as well. The only people who are left are Dennis and Valia. Now, Dennis is supposed to be in charge, as you may recall, but I, I guess at this point that just doesn't matter. Valia grabs Dennis's hand and pulls him down the hill, tries to get him away, and they do start to rush down the hill, but they hadn't gone far before Dennis, too, fell to the ground next to Valia in convulsions suffering from the same symptoms as her friends. And she stood there and watched until he went still as well, and he was also dead. Now, Valia is all that's left. 
She's the last person left. She's watched in a matter of minutes as everyone else in the group, all her friends, died in this horrific, terrible way that's really beyond comprehension what it was for her to see. I, you know, you could have imagined any number of things happening to Valia. I mean, you could imagine her just giving up at that point, just laying down and dying herself. But she doesn't do that. She's resolved. She wants to survive. So as hard as it was to do, she turns and runs down the hill, leaving her friends behind. She doesn't make any effort to to give them first aid or anything along those lines, and that was absolutely the right decision because they were beyond help. She rushes down the mountain to the forest. Now, all she has with her is a tent and some thermal plastic to keep her warm. Despite the horror and the cold and the threat of death all around her, she is so physically and mentally exhausted that as night falls on the mountain and she bundles herself up in that tent, she does fall asleep. (sighs) That's quite the dramatic like you said, matter of minutes, and for Valia to be the only one alive out of a group of seven, I can only imagine what's racing through her mind that night if she's even thinking clearly. And if I were her, I wouldn't know if I'd wake up the next morning. But as morning dawned on the next day, Valia did wake up, and she was still alive. It was now time to take stock of what had happened to her, She was on the side of a mountain, alone, in bitter conditions. She had no supplies, no food, no water, and she had only one option. She'd have to climb back up the mountain to where her friends had died and take whatever supplies she could find. Now remember, when you're hiking in a group, you split up your provisions and everyone kind of has different packs. You don't each individually pack everything one person would need because that's not an efficient way to travel as a group. And so she had a tent, you know, some thermal things, but she didn't have the food and the provisions she would need. They were back up with her dead friends. And Valia is so impressive in so many ways. I mean, she's impressive for even surviving the night. But I just got to tell you, I would probably end up dying in that forest because if I was at the bottom of the mountain, there's no way. It didn't, wouldn't matter what kind of supplies they had up there or how much I needed them or, or whatever. Going back up that mountain is probably not something that I could bring myself to do. No, especially because we have no idea what overcame them, right? It's like some silent killer, but it seems clear that it was not something genetic. It seemed environmental. So it's like this zone of death that she's entering back into. She's going back into the belly of the beast, so to speak, not knowing if she'd be so lucky to run out of that zone again. Now, slowly... Valia made her way up the mountain, and she found her friends, all dead, in the spots they had fallen the day before. As she entered the zone of death, she must have wondered if whatever had taken them would take her too. But whatever it had been seemed to be gone. Valia closed the dead, staring eyes of her friends and loaded up whatever supplies she could find. Just as you're thinking about, as you're going through the story, you're trying to think about what could possibly have caused this. And just this notion that this struck all these people down in this very small period of time, the day before, and then Valia gets up there and it seems fine. Number one, she survived it. Whatever it is, she survived it the first day. How that happened is hard to say. I mean, it depends on what it is, right? I mean, maybe she had some natural immunity to it. Somehow she wasn't susceptible to it. Maybe she just happened to be in the one space that, you know, if she'd have been two feet to the left or two feet to the right, she would have died too, but she she was in the perfect place. But whatever the case, whatever it was, whatever had been there, whatever caused this, it's gone by less than 24 hours later when she climbs back up that mountain. And she gets close to her friends. You know, the story is that she closed, their eyes were open, all their eyes were open, and she closed their eyes. That was the last thing she did for her friends. She couldn't do anything else for them. She's going to try and survive. She takes the, the supplies she can, and she's going she's gonna to try and live through this. Now, she wasn't leading this hike. She's, I think, the third youngest member of this hike. She's not the youngest, but she's, she's pretty young. I think she's 17, 17 at the time. Yeah, 17-year-old girl. And her 41-year-old leader... And 
you know, Sasha, who was in his 20s, I mean, these are the people who are supposed to be running this thing. She never thought she was going to have to navigate this hike on her own. So she has to figure out, what am I going to do? How am I going to survive? She has no idea where to go. She doesn't have any maps. If she did have a map, she probably wouldn't be able to read it. She sees some power lines on the side of this mountain, and she sees that they are heading down the mountains. And she figures where there are power lines, they have to go somewhere. And wherever they go, there are going to be people. So if I follow the power lines, maybe they will lead me somewhere. So for four days, she walks down the mountain following these power lines. And eventually she reaches a river. Now the power lines go over the river. But she decides, you know, the power line idea was a good idea. But now I'm going to follow the river because rivers also tend to lead to people. So, and where, you know, the way the river is going is down. So she's going to follow the river down as well. Now, at this point, she does something that might seem strange. She decides to wash her hair. (laughs) Now, you know, she is suffering from the early effects of hypothermia. She's probably not necessarily thinking clearly, but she will later say that she thought she was going to die and she wanted her hair to be clean and to look good if it came to that. If she was going to die, she wanted to have gray hair. That was <laughs> that was the last thing she wanted. So she decides to go into the river and wash her hair and it's possible that this decision actually saves her because she goes into the river and as she's going into the river, some kayakers come by. And they see this woman in the middle of the river washing her hair. And the kayakers actually, they continue on. And then as they're going down the river, they start talking to each other. And they're like, that was really weird. Why do you think she's in the river washing her hair? Because she didn't say anything to them. I mean, even though these people could save her, she's just washing her hair, right? Because clearly she's in shock. She's endured a lot. And so the kayakers decide to turn around and go back up the river to where she is. And they find her, and they realize she's in really bad shape. And so they take her back to their camp where they can warm her up. They give her that, you know, that coffee cup full of vodka. They hear this story that she's telling, and they then inform the local authorities that there has been this horrible tragedy on the mountains. Now, the authorities, they launch a search. We're going to talk about that search and the timing of that search in a minute. It's a little unusual. And when they find the bodies, they rule the case as, quote-unquote, accidental, and that the deaths were the result of hypothermia. Now, as you can imagine, much like the avalanche theory in the Dyatlov Pass case, this suggestion satisfied no one. No one who'd heard the story no one who'd seen the bodies. And to this day, the question remains, what killed the hikers on the slopes of Kamar Davin? Such a vivid image of her washing her hair as these kayakers pass by. And the strangest part to me is actually not her washing the hair, but her not calling out to the kayakers. I mean, I know she's in a state of shock, but that that's so bizarre to me. Yeah, it is unusual, but I just, I think with all she'd seen and all she'd endured, it seems like she had kind of resigned herself that she was going to die, even though she's she's doing the right things and she's heading in the general direction of civilization. But, you know, it is weird that she didn't, she didn't, but that's what they say, that she, that was one of the strangest things is she's washing her hair and she didn't say anything to him. She didn't call out to him. She didn't say hello to him, nothing. And they realized this is weird. This is strange. We need to go back and check on this girl. So very, Ooh. very unusual situation all all around. And you're right. She is incredible being 17 years old and not supposed to have to lead her own hike essentially saves herself. And it could have ended very, very differently for her. And then we wouldn't know the story. Um, so let's jump into the timeline. August 2nd, 1993, the group arrives in Merino, Burkutz, on the shores of Lake Bakal. They had come from Petropol, Kazakhstan, via the Trans-Siberian Railroad. They were one of at least three groups hiking the mountain at that time, including the group being led by Ludmilla's daughter, Natalia. 
The next day, on August 3rd, the group made their way up the mountainside known as the Peak Retranslator, or Mount Tritons. Unlike the Dyatlov Pass, this was not an area of complete wilderness. Indeed, there was a structure on top of the mountain that served as a shelter for hikers. Inside, one could find protection from the weather and supplies. Although the weather had held for the day, by that night, everyone was surprised to see that rain had begun. And you may recall, that was not the prediction. The prediction was this was going to be a beautiful August time here in the mountains. Now, Siberia, you know, it's a crazy place. As we said earlier, this is a place of wild weather swings. It gets very, very cold. But this is August. You never really know what to expect in August in this area. But what they were told to expect was clear weather, warm weather, perfect weather for a hike. But then all of a sudden, this night, it just starts pouring rain. And by the next day, the 4th of August, the rosy prediction of warm, dry weather, completely gone. The situation had entirely deteriorated. An unending torrential downpour began, and the temperature continued to plunge. Now that they were thoroughly soaked, it began to snow. And if any of you have ever been in a situation, I would rather be in like zero degrees, zero degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, minus something Celsius in a cold weather with snow. That is much better than like 31 degrees Fahrenheit or like, you know, minus one degrees Celsius where it's not quite cold enough for it to be snow. So instead it's this really, really icy cold rain that soaks you to the bone and then you freeze. I mean, that's the absolute worst. And that's what they're experiencing here. We've had all this rain, everything soaked, and now it's so cold it's snowing. So you can just imagine how cold they are now getting. And to make matters worse, they have these packs and they have all these supplies and they have all these extra clothes in them. Well, now they are much heavier than they had been before because they are also soaked with water. So they are heavier because of that and they're having to carry extra weight up the mountain, which is slowing them down as well. And to make matters worse, they'd actually spent the previous day sort of taking their time going up the trail, collecting golden root which is a plant that grows on the side of the mountain and is prized to this day in Russia for its supposed medicinal properties. So they're already behind schedule. They're trying to climb this mountain. It's pouring down rain. Their clothes are soaked. Now it's so cold, it's snowing. And as the rain is pouring and they are freezing to death, they emerge from the forest into this rugged, barren final ascent up the mountain. So they've been in the forest and that's bad enough, but now there's no cover. The area has no plants. There's nothing to hide behind or hide under. They've sort of reached that point on the mountain. And those of you who've ever been on one of these more extreme hikes know this. There's just a point where the plants end and all you have is mountain now. All you have is rocks, barren rock. And that's that's what they're on. So now not only is it pouring down rain, but they're on this like wind swept, rocky just wide open place on the side of this mountain. You can only imagine what's going through their mind. You can only imagine sort of the effect this is having on them. The going is incredibly slow. And at some point, the group makes a decision. Instead of continuing up the summit, this is a decision that people are going to question until the end of the time. This is much like, this is going to have echoes of Dyatlov Pass like crazy. Instead of continuing up the summit, which is only a few hundred meters away, so like maybe half a mile at most, and they know that on the summit, like Alice said, there is a shelter up there, there's firewood that's going to be dry, they can build a fire, there's going to be supplies, there's going to be food. They decide to make camp on the mountainside. So they're going to camp on the side of the mountain instead of continuing up the mountain in trying to reach this shelter. Now it's cold, it's raining, it's sleeting, eventually it's snowing. Making a fire on the mountainside is always difficult in any event, but it's absolutely impossible that night. There's no way they're going to be able to do that. So they're going to have to spend a, spend a night. They're going to have to spend a night on the side of this mountain 
that it, they're going to be it's going to be cold, they're going to be wet, they're going to be chilled to the bone because of this and there's going to be no relief. And you got this wind that we talked about. It's whipping across this mountain and with such force that it occasionally actually lifts the tent into the air and rips it from its mooring. So the tent's like coming up. Now they're inside the tent, so it's not like the tent's going to blow away. But part of the tent is, you know, being lifted up in the air. They're having to go outside at least twice that night. They're having to go outside in the middle of the night, in the rain, in the wind, in the snow, and resecure this tent to the ground. And every time it gets lifted up, just more water is pouring in on top of them. I mean, it sounds like just the most absolutely miserable, horrible way to spend a night that you could imagine. And I will talk more about this, but I do wonder if the decision that was made to camp instead of forge forward was, like you said, there were some young hikers in this group. You know, you you don't leave anyone behind. So you are your weakest link. You are your slowest hiker. And so if there's any sort of, any one of the seven said, I can't go on, I would think that the decision by Ludmilla is we all stop because unless they can carry the person, but you can't really carry someone up a summit. And look, if you've ever been in a situation where you've pushed yourself to your physical limit, you've done, whether it's a hike or, you know, sport of some sort, whatever it is, if you've ever done anything where you've really pushed yourself to your limit, there comes a point where you, whether it's true or not, your brain is telling you, I cannot do anything else. I cannot take one more step. I cannot do anything. I just need to sit down. I cannot move, right? I mean, that happens to everybody. And really the greatest and the best athletes can push through that to some point. But everybody hits the wall at some point. Like at some point, there is literally a point where you cannot go forward. And in addition to what is already a taxing experience that they're doing. I mean, this is not an easy hike. I mean, this is a difficult hike that they've planned. And now on top of that, you've got all of this horrible condition, which is going to make it so much harder and so much more painful to do anything. And you can imagine, like Alice said, these young people, and maybe even some of the older people are like, we just can't go further. We know that that shelter's up there. And man, we wish we could just go to that shelter, but we can't do it. We physically cannot go one more step, and as Alice said, you can't just leave somebody behind. I mean, she's not going to just say to the 15-year-old or whatever in the group, well, sorry, you know, if you're still alive tomorrow, we'll pick you up on the way back down, right? She's not going to do that. So whatever the reason, they stop. Now, on August 5th, the group woke up the next morning and snow had blanketed the area. The group was able to get a fire going finally and eat breakfast. But it seems clear that at this point, Ludmilla recognized the danger that they were all in. Remember, she's a survivalist, right? She teaches survival skills for her students. Now, after days of freezing rain and exhaustion, the group was particularly susceptible to cold temperatures. At this point, Ludmilla ordered the group to start heading back down the mountain. So the opposite of their ultimate goal. Only a few minutes after leaving the campsite, the deaths began. So you've got this situation where they did manage to get a fire going, so that's good. And they were eating breakfast, but they're not going to make it to the summit at all. I think this kind of goes to what we're talking about with, you know, why didn't they try for the summit the day before? They weren't even going to try for it after a night, a terrible night. They they didn't think they could make it to the top, so... And really just sort of abandoning this. He's just like, look, we're just gonna we're just gonna go down then. We're not even gonna worry about going up to the top. But whatever it was that befell them at that point happened very quickly afterwards. So they had not gone far when suddenly this event, whatever this event is, occurred. Brett, before we move on, I know we've asked this many times. How many of you wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? Our sponsor, PDS Debt, has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, medical bills, collections, or any other type of debt. Because of the tough year from COVID-19, certain types of debt can now be reduced and in some cases completely eliminated from your credit. There are more options now than ever before to take control of your debt, and the experts at PDS Debt can help. 
Alice, we've been talking about PDS Debt for a while. They're one of our oldest sponsors and one of our best. And we hope you guys will give them a shot because they are giving our listeners a free debt analysis and copy of your credit report just for completing the 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash prosecute. You will receive a full breakdown of all the interest you shouldn't be paying each month and multiple options on how they can help get rid of it. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. The average American with credit card or personal loan debt over $5,000 ends up paying back two and a half times what they originally spent. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $5,000 in debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit are accepted. You can save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is offering free credit reports to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash prosecute. That's P-D-S-D-E-B-T dot com slash prosecute. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash prosecute. After these deaths from August 6th through 9th, Valia slowly made her way down the mountain, and four days later, she was rescued by the kayakers. Remember, she tells the kayakers this horrid story, and they alert authorities right away. But it's not till August 21st that the first searchers go out. That's, what, two weeks after the deaths. And it's not until August 26th that the six bodies were found. And at this point, their bodies were severely deteriorated, and it has been reported that all of their eyes were missing. Which is one of those creepy things that's always added on to the story. But certainly, given how much time it takes, and we're going to talk about that later, maybe in the next episode, it's not all that surprising that scavengers have gotten to the bodies, that they are, you know, I mean, they're laying on the side of the mountain for three weeks. There's going to be some decomposition, and there's going to be scavengers who go after the body. So that's not all that surprising. Well, I think we're going to stop here for now and we'll come back next week and dive into all of the strangeness that we've already laid out for you at this point. You know, we're going to give you some ideas that people have proposed about what may have affected the hikers and what they might be suffering from. As you think about this case, I don't know what conclusion we're going to come to in the end. Alice and I talked about this before we started and, and very sort of unsure of exactly what happened in this case. But, you know, the sort of those of you out there with the logical skeptical minds are probably thinking about the fact that one thing that has already happened is things have gone very wrong on this hike. So before anybody dies, things are going really bad. And it is so much colder than they expect it to be, and they're so much tired, more tired than they expect it to be, and the physical exhaustion and, and all of that on their bodies is, is great. And so you may be thinking, could that have something to do with this? We're going to talk about that, about whether or not what they were experiencing might be able to explain some of this. We'll talk about more about the decision to camp on the side of the mountain, why it took the authorities so long to go out and look for these folks. We'll talk about some of the injuries to the bodies in this case. They're not as dramatic as in Dyatlov Pass, but there are some injuries which are interesting and kind of inexplicable. And then when we go through all that, we'll try and reach some sort of conclusion about what happened in this great mystery, yet another great mystery from Russia, though this one is from 1993, so much more recent than Dyatlov Pass, and you would think that would be to our benefit. You would think that that would mean we'd have more information and maybe it would be easier to solve this case, but unfortunately that's not the case, but we're going to try and get to the bottom of it anyway. Well, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to think about this at this point. If you have any additional information that we left out or any corrections you want to make or any questions you have, reach out to us at prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod on all your social media. As most of you know, we're very responsive on all that. Check us out on Reddit, YouTube. Join our Patreon page if you're so inclined to get ad-free episodes and occasional 
additional things from us. And don't forget to leave those five-star reviews on Apple. And most importantly, tell your friends because that is the best way to help us continue to grow the podcast. Well, Alice, before we sign off for today, do you have anything else you want to add to this this very mysterious case? This is one we could have done in October if we'd wanted to. I mean, this is a this is a weird one. This one is so strange. It, this, I mean, Dyatlov Pass uh, clearly boggled all of our minds, and my mind still churns over what happened in Dyatlov Pass. But to think that not too far away in the same country, separated by a few decades, kind of an equally mysterious. Uh, death is happening is just it, it really just stretches my mind yeah and the thing that just continues to blow my mind about this is we have a witness you know we have somebody who was there who's telling us what they saw and yet it is not making this simpler if Valya had died on the side of that mountain then this would be a mystery but it's probably one where we would all basically accept some very simplistic idea it was raining it was cold they weren't prepared for it they all died of hypothermia, which is what the authorities want you to believe. It happened anyway, right? But you have that thing that you didn't have at Dyatlov Pass. You have a witness. I mean, it's as if you had a witness at Dyatlov Pass who was like radioactive yetis, came out of the forest, and started killing everybody, and I ran away. I mean, that's essentially what you have here. You have this witness who is telling you these crazy things that just don't even seem possible and yet she was there she is the only survivor she is the only one who who saw what what may have happened so i don't know to me that is just that is the most mind-blowing thing of all well we have so much more to say about this case when we join you again next week but until then i'm brett and i'm alice and we are the prosecutors. August second, nineteen ninety three. The group arrives in Marino or er, uh, how do you say it? Irkutsk. Irkutsk. Oh, I was doing so well. August 2nd, 1993, the group arrives in Marino, Irkutsk, on the shores of Lake Baikal. Bacal? Bacal. Uh, now I've forgotten everything you said. <laughs> do you on want me shores... to read this part? No, no, I, I can do this. I like, I was so excited. I practiced. Now I forgot everything. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. I can do this. 25th time is the time. Okay. Or Mount Triton, Tritons, Tritrans. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, this is so bad. This is so bad. Okay, I'm just gonna do the whole sentence over again. Okay, the next day, whole, whatever you August, say works. 